like with dash C, dash S, or dash E with multiple files. And so I was wondering if like that meant anything because I, yeah, I, I've been Googling it and I can't really find a way to fix it. Yeah, so um, honestly, I will have to look at your, at your main file to see what's going on. Um, the dash C, so I don't remember if we had any, any particular examples about this in the, in the slides. Um, but the dash C, what does is it generates the object file, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't, it compiles the code, but it doesn't generate an executable, right? So you do dash C and then for instance, if, if your um, randomized function is called randomized.cpp, then you expect to generate something like randomized.o. Uh, and then at the end, when you link everything uh, with your main function and some table, then you will, you will add all these objects um, to generate uh, the executable. And you don't put the dash C flag at the end, right? In that linking stage. Uh, so basically, we break this um, this compilation in two steps. Uh, one is to generate from each of the modules the object files, and then bring them all together. Perhaps the best place to look into this is, and I don't remember, Francis, you, you may recall better than me. Maybe you have an example uh, in your in your lecture. I think it was lecture three. Um, um, yeah. Okay, so that yeah, that's that's I, um, Mohammed has pasted the, uh, command. the line, yeah. so here here's the issue with this command is that you have two CPP files, and you're at, and each CPP file should be translated into its its own object okay. file. So rather than having one compilation line for all of them and putting it in one object file, you need a separate compilation line for each of them. Um, so okay. something like oops. G plus plus dash C O file one dot O file one dot CPP for one. And um, I'm typing this in the uh, in the chat, yes. Yeah. So and then for the second file it should be something like that. And now you have two dot O files. So every CPP file can only create one object file. And I think that's what it's complaining about. Even worse is when you try and do something, and you shouldn't, but when you try and do something where oh, what happened? And I'm sharing the desktop, so uh, the or you can share. Why don't you share better your your terminal? Sure. Um, so you know it's part of the recording. <laughs> let's see. Right. Because it will remain just on the chat, right? Okay. There you go. Okay. So okay. let's let's imagine that you have a. Oh, not this one. Let's do it in the terminal. So let's imagine you have a make file and you have a couple of codes. So uh, you want to compile an application that depends on two files. They they would get linked together, app file, so two. And then each of those files has to separately be compiled. Um, so for each of them. So one does this. If I, and the same for two. So if I put two CPP files here um, and, I, and I give it an output file, basically the compiler gets a little confused. You can have it compile two things it turns out, and then it, they, it produces two object files. That's the, that's the rule. You give it two source files, you get two object files. So you could do that. You shouldn't because um, you can't then tell make how the dependencies are. But, uh, but if you do this, and then you also in addition say, hey, what should be the file name? Now it's like you're saying both of these files should be compiled to the same file name, but that can be. It should produce two files. And there is no option to say give two files. So that's what's happening. Um, if you do them one by one, um, you are fine. Um, yeah, uh, just once it's just for the sake of, of completion, sure. there is the dash C flag missing. Oh yes, I'm missing the dash Cs. What happened there? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of how it would look like. Plus all the 10 uh, SCD uh, 14, yeah. et, et cetera, right? Um, 
Yeah. So the other thing to warn against or, or about is that if you if you had extra dependencies, say this depended on file 2.h, um, it might be tempting to try and put file 2.h here. Um, and that's that's almost even worse. Uh, your, your, either your compiler complains, depends on the version, um, or it produces a file that isn't even an object file. Um, the header files do not need to be compiled. They are included, and that that is enough. They should not also be compiled. Um, and this can happen automatically if you have if you use like and that that is in the make file if you include special commands like this. This is hard to see. Yeah. Um, so this this uh, variable dollar uh, up um, replaces gets replaced by all of the file names that are dependent here, and that's that is the wrong thing to do here. Um, so it's better just to be to be specific. There are ways to use these variables in a way that is correct, but um, it's so much easier just to write down. Um, there is one that gives you just the first dependency. After. That's right. That's right. But that is also a little tricky because what if you wrote your dependency? No, no sure, sure. I, I just say if, if someone yeah. wants to use, it's all right with using, you know, those. Oh, files. it's okay. But, but with these automatic things, once you have multiple dependencies, you kind of have to know exactly what it means. The same with the, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's, I, I, yeah, they're in the make file, they're okay, but you will, you will want to replace them with the explicit lines that you want yeah, to yeah. happen. Um, okay, so that's, that was a long explanation of- No, why. that was very good. Thank you, Francis, for that. Um, uh, any other questions? I think it's, it's worth taking the time to, to, to answer these questions. I think they was asking, um, which question, uh, if the const array need to make uh, be dynamically allocated, we say no, if you're talking about the moves. Uh, array that's fine. It's a tiny array, so that should be okay. Yeah, um, they're, they're almost they're, they're, It's a small array, um, which is kind of why it works. Um, it, it's it's not the ideal thing, but um, it's also only used in certain parts of the code. So you could you could hide it somewhere else. Um, think about that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You don't really need the moose array all floating around all the, the, the parts of the code. It can be restricted to the only part where it's being used, right? So that helps a little bit. Um, any other questions, guys? No, all good. Okay, so then we are going to uh, be talking about version control today. So let me start by sharing uh, my slides. Second, let me go for the screen here. Okay. And let me recover the chat because I lost that. Okay. Um, oh, one more question from Dashes. Uh, just to make sure we're converting all uh, the 2D arrays. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, Brandon, is it still considered a global variable if it is in the top of in paint? Um, global variables. So I think we, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, global variables are, are acceptable. The, the issue with the global variables is if there is a function that uses these particular variables, for, for instance, number of ants, let's say, then the function should not access that variable if it is not part of the arguments that the function receives. So yes, you will have global variables because those are, like strictly speaking, the ones that you define in your in, in main function. But the main issue is, we don't want your functions accessing those global variables without receiving them as arguments. Okay. So you should, but my specific company. Yes, that's right. So depending where you define inside main, it's not strictly global. I, I agree with that. Um, Uh, that's okay. You can have in particular uh, scopes of the main function or, or not. But again, I will emphasize this. The, the main thing is having them pass into the, um, into the corresponding functions. Okay. Just one thing um, I want to be sure. Are you guys seeing full screen or are you seeing the Acrobat 
thingy around my slides. I'm seeing the Acrobat thing around yourself. Okay, okay, let me let me retry that. Yeah, I was checking something. I don't know why he's doing that. Thank you, Rob. Uh, let's try this again. What about now? Is it better? And you guys see the, the full screen thing now? Yeah, that looks okay. great. Awesome, thank you. Um, perfect, thank you guys. All right, so again, if you have more questions, keep it in mind. We, we can come back to this at the end of the lecture. Um, so it's, it's a good discussion, okay? So we're going to be talking about another tool that is not um, exactly tied to C++ or any particular programming language, very similar to make on that regards, and it's called version control. And the particular flavor that we're going to be discussing today is Git. So the plan for today is that. Um, just to put in context, this is one of the, of, of the main elements or, or basic foundations, if you wish, of best practice in any kind of, of project related to software development. Uh, so we talk about modularity, we talk about automation, building tools, make, um, and today the, is, 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 um, is the turn to talk about version control. Now there are two, a couple more um, of points also part of these best practices. Uh, one is defensive programming, which I believe we are going to skip in the course, but we're going to be talking about unit testing at some point. Um, we can be achieved in, in C, C++ with, with the boost and standard template library. Um, so what is version control? And, and just to have a, uh, an idea, if you guys want, just let me know in the chat how many of you are familiar with any flavor, any version of, of version control that you are using, or if this is the, the first time that you are uh, hearing about it. Um, so just to know how much detail I, 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 I should provide or I should emphasize. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. So we have a, a good mix. Some people that have used uh, version control, some people that even have used version control through the web interfaces, and some people that have no use. So I, I think we are going to, to basically cover all the details that you need to know for, for starting with version control. And of course, if something is not clear, please let us know. Okay. So first of all, version control is, is, is a tool, it's a program actually to managing changes in a set of files. It can be any set of files. That's why I'm saying it's not explicitly tied or related to C or C++. It can be applied to almost anything. It works very nicely, really nicely, when uh, this set of files is text-based. And when I say text-based, you can think of things like scripts, source code, that kind of things. It can also work with binary files. It can also work with Word documents. Um, but what it really shines is, is with text-based files. What it allows you to do? Well, it allows you to keep track of different versions. Uh, so for instance, I have here one of the, of the cartoons from uh, PhD Comics, and this is something that has happened to many of us, probably a set of files containing data or containing manuscripts that are renamed after every time that you do a, a meaningful change in that, so you keep track. Well, version control will help you to do that, but in a, in a more elegant, fashion, let's say. Uh, what basically can do for you, well, it can take a snapshot of the file, the code in this particular case, as we're going to use in the course, at a given moment in time. Now, this tool, um, one of the, of the main things is it works nicely, oops, sorry, it works nicely, uh, but it requires that you take full control. So it's not like the snapshots can be taken every five minutes uh, or something, you may write a script for doing that. I, I, I wouldn't recommend do it though. Um, but it, it requires your intervention. It requires that you actively say to Git, okay, this, this is a good uh, modification of the code or this is something I would like to keep track of and then take that particular snapshot. Why using it? Uh, some people may complain it's a little bit more of, of, of gymnastics involved. Um, I like that term gymnastics because it, it requires repetition of things, but uh, yes, it's true. It requires a little bit more of, of pre-work, um, but it, it pays off. So it makes collaboration on code easier possible. And I like the term less violent. Some people will laugh at that when I say that, but it's true. Um, it helps you stay organized. 
it allows you to track change to track changes in the code and it allows you for, for reproducibility in the code and actually um i may mention this at the end some journals nowadays they have gone all in with version control. Basically, when you submit a manuscript, uh, the whole process is, is under version control. So you actually had to do it through, through the repository. Uh, in, very importantly, I would say, it allows you to go back to a previous working version. And this is substantial uh, or, or meaningful when you are developing code. Let's say you implemented a change and, and suddenly everything stopped working. Well, version control will allow you to back up to the previous working version, of course. This is not automatic. You have to uh, instruct Git when, when you want to take this snapshot. And thank you, Ransom. Um, so this is another way you can think about version control, working in your manuscript or your thesis, and interacting with a collaborator or your supervisor or, or, or a lab mate, and then everyone working in, the, in their comments. So this is something like uh, people using, for instance, I, I, I have the pleasure of working with biologists on papers and and it's just a headache because they like to use word and they like to do the version control with the comments on it and it's just, just it's a, it's a no-go for me it's a deal breaker so version control will, will help you with that um just to give you an idea especially for those of you who haven't used version control this is more or less what you will expect and this this kind of uh diagram uh, tries to represent a couple of things. First is how uh, version control works um, in terms of, of the actions that you will perform, but also in terms of the files and the space that will take in your computer. So this, let's, let's bear with mine and, and please give me all the criticisms that, that you think this, this representation deserves because it was something I was trying, trying to come out with. Uh, so this box here on, on light gray represents what is the Git repository. And we're going to dive into these terms in a second. Uh, in your computer is basically a hidden directory in your machine. And what is happening is in particular with, with Git, which is one version or, or one implementation of version control, there is what is called a staging area. Uh, that is sort of a place where you put the files that you want to track, but they are still not part of what is the repository. This is a snapshot that we will take of the, of the files. So it's like promising that the repository will have that file, but yet not committed to the repository. So this red arrow represents sort of the local directory or where your files uh, are located. Then you will do we're going to see examples of this, uh, a, a command called git add and the name of the file where it will put the file in this staging area. And then finally that file will be, will be taken into the repository uh, by doing git commit. Of course, this can change in time. So if you have a given file, you will be working on the file, change something, do git additions. And then when you're happy with the, with the final version that you have, do git commit. The things that you will be able to recover, which are the ones presented in the master branch are these snapshots. Uh, they're taken in this dark brown or dark red uh, arrow. Okay, so it's something that will interact or allow you to change things in time, but they are going to be located in your in, in, in the repository, which will live in a particular directory in your computer. Now, you can have as many repositories uh, as you wish. You can even use um, remote repositories using web-based services. We're going to be using remote repositories, but in the cluster, so you will have the repositories in the cluster. There are ways to connect the repositories and transfers. If you wish, you can even transfer files uh, through Git um, by doing push and pull. I may mention this later on. Um, so it's a really, really powerful tool to, to, to use and, and keep in mind. And, and from now on, for all the assignments that we will have, we are going to be using uh, Git in, in, in the assignments as well. Uh, I think so, uh, Dave, uh, Gabe, sorry. I think so. Um, any particular restriction what you may be facing or thinking of? No, oh, okay, yeah, then, then I will, uh, yes. I, as I say, it, it will work with um, any particular file, uh, even binary data, it won't, it won't you know, it won't shy some of the things I will show you today, but it will just just work. So, and and uh, I don't think I have anything in the slides about this, but I'm happy to comment later. There is something for handling very big data files. 
um, I think it's called Git. Uh, do you remember Rancis Git, Git NF or Git LS? Something like Git. I think it's Git LS large size files or something like that. So it allows you, it's a, it's a sort of a smartness on top of Git. Um, so you, you, in principle, yes, I would say yes. All right. Um, so how, how does Git work? So let's take a quick look and, and with some few examples. So there will be a central repository where, as we say, one of the things that Git can do is it can allow people to collaborate. Uh, not only we probably, I know sure last year we have a, an assignment where people were sharing code mostly for peer review. I'm not sure if we're going to do this this year, but that could be an example, for instance. But in, in the worst case, even if you are working alone on that, um, it's your central repository where you will be accessing the code and, and doing the check-ins and check-outs. So basically, anyone can access this repository, if you allow, of course. Um, and you can get one of the versions, one of the copies of, of that code, modify the code, and then check in the code again. And similarly, one of your collaborators can do that, can make modifications and check in. In the process of updating or pulling uh, from the repository and pushing through the repository, Git will, change, will, will check if there have been changes and if, if these changes overlap. So if the changes overlap, it will warn you, it's probably not allow you to do uh, what we call the merge automatically, but it will guide you in how to fix it. Uh, if, there are, if the changes do not overlap, think about writing a manuscript again, and someone is writing, working in the introduction section and someone is working in the meta section, those two sections will not overlap, so the changes will, will be merged uh, smoothly. Um, this is another silly example, if you wish, is, is a way, how, again, more mostly thought for people that is not used to how version control works. Uh, there is what we call the main trunk, is, is uh, an analogy for the repository, if you wish. Uh, let's say we are, we are keeping a, a version control of the shopping list that we have to do at the end of the week. So we run out of milk. So the first revision of the shopping list is to add milk to the list. Um, next day we run out of eggs. So we add eggs to the, to the, to the shopping list. Of course, each of these, these changes are committed to the main trunk, to the repository. The, the third day we run out of shoes. So we add shoes. But on the first day, let's say I stop by uh, Rabas and I get some shoes, and then I remove shoes from my, my shopping list, but I add soup. So that's more or less, that's the idea. You go keeping track of any substantial change to whatever information you, you collect in that repository, and you do the commits every time that something has to be updated. Now, let me say this, the more fine, um, or granular control that you, you store in these commits is the more powerful change that you, you can recover, right? So if you, if you are very, very uh, strict with all the changes and you keep all of them, then you have more granularity for recovering things. Uh, if you work in a ball and then you do changes and don't commit frequently, then your, your chances of recovering small things will be less. So it's a little bit of, of you know, keeping an eye on the, on, on, on the things and, and trying to keep us as close as, as changes come by the code. Uh, this is another thing that, and this is just looking in detail in between revision three and revision four here in the example, what will happen in the repository is after I got revision three, um, as I told you, I, I, I took out shoes. So my new checkout is going to include meal, eggs and soup. And that is what is going to be revision four. Now, this is what at this stage I will call the working copy. Um, and at this point, I could revert to revision three. If I do revision four, then I can come back to this, but it won't be a reversion. It will be something else. It will be a checkout. Okay. But by keeping these copies, by doing these commits, is where I can put basically stamps in my timeline and recover whatever version I want in, in the set of files. Um, so a quick summary on how you uh, will do for installing uh, Git in your computer. And after this, I, I will stop for and asking for, for questions. So I mentioned this, there are many different types and approaches to version control. The one that we're going to discuss and use in the course is called Git. It was created by uh, Linus Tower, which is the same person who created Linux. Uh, there are four main things that you need to do to get started with Git. So the first one, and this is talking about your own computers. Uh, on the cluster, Git is, is, is there for you. But on your own computers, you will need to set up Git 
uh, basically download Git, and I have some, some suggestions on how to do it depending on the operating system. And then after you install Git, uh, you will initialize our Git repository. This is done for every single project that you want to put under version control, and you can have as many as you wish. Uh, the way it will work is Git will create a hidden directory within the folder and contain that folder and subfolder, subdirectories within that folder. Then commit all the files that you want to keep track of, modify, uh, edit the files as you wish, and then uh, just keep doing that. So if you are in a Linux operating system, uh, it's very likely that Git is part of your OS already, but if it's not, you can just install it using the package manager. If you are in CentOS or Red Hat, YAM, if you are in Linux, uh, sorry, in Ubuntu uh, or uh, any other APT gate will do it. So I will say if you guys are using Linux, you probably are very, very uh, familiar with these tools. Uh, if you are in Mac OS, I know we have uh, uh, some of you working in, in Macs. There are three different ways in which you can install Git. Don't do the three, just pick one and, and that will do it. You can install it through Xcode. So probably if, you, if you're in the latest version of Mac OS and you type just Git in the terminal, it will tell you, okay, uh, if Git is not installed, it will tell you Git is not part of your Xcode development uh, toolkit. Do you want to install it? And you just do it. If not, this has a hyperlink where you can download uh, Esco and, uh, and Git from for Mac. If you are using one of the package managers uh, that ports a lot of Linux tools into Mac OS, then uh, you just pick either Fink, Mac ports, or Homebrew. And, and if, you, if you know what, you, what I'm talking about, you, you're probably familiar with this, so you can install it that way. If none of these work or you don't want to try, there is our X uh, Git installer. Again, it's a hyperlink where you can just click there and it will try to install uh, Git for you. Okay. But then there is a four version where you can install something called Git bash, um, which brings Git plus on other commands from the from the from the from the terminal. Uh, but again, just pick one, don't do the three again. Uh, the three, just one will do it. If you are on Windows and you are Mobile Extend, which is the one I think was recommended for you to use because it can allow you to get graphics from the cluster, you just type in the Mobile Extend apt get install Git. And again, let me reemphasize this. This is if you want to work with Git in your local computers, which again is something I, I, I will uh, encourage you to do at least just for trying and putting your, your, your process under version control. So let me stop here for a second and, and ask you if you guys have any questions so far. No, all good. All right. So let me show you a little bit of how one uh, will go around using Git, and if we have time, we can um, we can uh, see an example. And again, it, it maybe it's a good idea because from now on, as I say, all your assignments will be under version control. So the first thing, so I'm not going to assume that in this machine is is Git already installed. And the first thing I'm going to do is set up a repository. So I'm, I'm going to assume that in this computer, I have a directory called code. So I'm going to do CD code. And the first thing for initializing a repository is to issue this command, git space init. Now, git, uh, as you can imagine, is, is a Linux style command. So it works in a very similar fashion as all the Linux commands we have seen so far, like the compiler, C++, and then flags and, and file names. So Git works on that way. So the main command is Git, and then there are what we call subcommands that are, if you want to think about that, flags or options for the Git command. So init is the flag or, or the subcommand for initializing a repository. So you do git space init. Now Git will respond, initialize it, empty Git repository, and wherever that location is. So in this particular case, as you can see, is on the cluster on Niagara or the teach clusters. It's in my home. This is my group. This is my username, and this is the directory which I started the repository. And as you can see, there is this .git subdirectory that was just created by Git, and this is where all the information about the repository, all the version control, will be stored. Other than that, nothing else uh, happened. Actually, if you do ls here, it will show an empty directory uh, because it's empty right now. 
but if I do ls a, now I see this this uh, hidden subdirectory dot git. Okay, so that is where Git is going to store all the information for keeping track of, of all the changes in the files that we want to track, right? So first command, very easy, uh, very benign, I would say, git in it, nothing, nothing necessarily uh, complex or, or profound about it. So the second thing that may happen, and this will happen the first time that we may try to commit something, is that git because if he want, Git wants to keep track of who did that, who did what and when, uh, it will ask you to identify. So the first time, if, if you are not identified in the system, this won't happen on Niagara, I believe, because it has the user names. Um, but in your computer, it may happen if, um, is that it will ask you to say who you are and what is your email. So that's the way to, to keep track of who uh, did when and what to something. So the way to do that, uh, and this you will see a, a message like this, when you try to do your first commit is, please tell me who you are. That's, that's literally what Git will tell you. And then it will tell you how to fix this. Run git config dash dash global user dot email, and then your email, git config dash dash global username, your name. Um, the dash dash global flag, by the way, means that you want to use these uh, credentials or this way to identify in yourself for all the projects in that computer. Uh, what means is that I can have repositories where, for instance, if I'm working with people at U of T, I may want to use my U of T email. If I want with people, external collaborators, I may want to use my sign at email or my Gmail or whatever. So you have full control of what credentials you put for each repository. Uh, if you want to check uh, if you are identified by Git, you can do git config username and git config user email. And if this is empty, if nothing is, be show, is being shown by these commands, then it means that you need to set up this, okay? I just want to warn you because it may happen again, especially if you're using in, the, in your own computer, that Git will not uh, basically, uh, will not succeed in, in, in doing the commit unless you set these variables. There are other ways to set this up, but, but this is an easy way to check. Uh, no, this is completely independent. Good question, Beran. Uh, this is completely independent of GitHub. Uh, there are ways, uh, I don't have anything here, but I can show you or, or give you some resources on how to connect your repository. This is your repository living in your own machine or in the cluster uh, with GitHub repositories. Oh, yes. <laughs> so the GitHub, uh, I, I may talk a little bit about that. GitHub is a web interface where it allows you to basically put your repositories on the web. And that is nice because it basically gives access to everyone. You don't have to have a computer with internet access to allow your collaborators pushing into your repository or, or pulling from your repository. Um, so it's, it's a nice, it's a nice tool, I, I would say. But yes, it's, it's different from Git. It works on top of Git. Uh, or implements a version of Git using a web interface, but this is uh, is something different right now. Okay, so you don't need GitHub for any of the things that we are going to do. Okay, it's a good question. So if you need to fix that, how you will do it? So git config dash dash global user email, that's my username, git config dash dash global username, uh, my name. Now, by the way, these this funny quotation marks are just the double quotation marks. So I don't know why in the slides, uh, I think it's the, the, the phone encoding that is showing like that, but just use double quotation marks or single quotation marks, be consistent with which one you pick and, and, and that will do it, okay? Um, by the way, if you guys want to try this in your computers and you have Git, feel free to, to give it a shot and, and, and if there is anything that is not working, let us know. So. We have initialized our, our Git repository. We have checked that our credentials are associated with, with, the, with the repository, how we add files into the repository. So this is a very dirty and quick way of adding something to the repository. Uh, I'm going to use the echo command, which is a command from Linux. Usually it displays things on the screen, but they're going to use this greater than symbol as we saw in last assignment or previous assignment, I should say that it will redirect this into a file called temp.txt. And that is going to be my example for uh, keeping track of, of the changes on that file. And then I'm going to do a, a, a replica of that file called temp.txt. Uh, uh, temp 
So I will have by the end two files, temp2.txt and temp.txt. Both files will contain the text some data inside of them, just text files. Now the example goes as I want to add these two files to my version control. So I will do git and then add is the command for adding the files. And then the dot represents all the files within that directory, okay? So if I do git add dot, it will add these two files to my version control, to my repository. But remember this so far, this command until this point just put the files in the staging area. It's not yet part of the repository per se. So my second step, and this is one of the, of the peculiarities, some people will say nice features, other people will say annoyances of git is that you always need to do these two steps or at least it's recommended you do in this way is to git commit, just to commit, and then a meaningful message. So this meaningful message is, 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 is truly meaningful because it will represent the way that you can recover information by looking at the log of changes in the different versions that you have commit to the repository. So the more verbose, the more detailed that you can be on those messages is the better because then you will look at this log and will say, oh, this is the change I did in this particular version. So this, this will allow you to give some hints on, on what version you may be looking uh, for. So it's sort of, if you, if you work in web labs, it's sort of a, a, of a lab note that you keep, what do you do each day in each experiment, that kind of metadata? Well, this is, this is sort of that. If everything goes well, after you issue the git commit command, then git will respond with some um, messages basically specifying what happened. So my, my message here, which goes again between quotation marks, says first commit for my repository. That's the message that this is being repeat. And then how many files being uh, added? So in this case, there were two files changed because we add that's the two insertions and we didn't delete any file. And this is the name of the files and then some, some particular details for Git. Okay. So again, two steps for committing messages, committing, sorry, uh, files to the repository, Git add, and this dot can be substituted by the file name of the specific file I want to add. And then git commit with a meaningful message representing what the change that we are adding to the repository means. In this case, it's the first commit of my file. Uh, if git is initialized in a directory, I'm reading just one of the questions from the chat. If git is initialized in a directory which contains many other directories and files, will git add and commit include all the system files and directories? It will only include the, direct, the files in the local directory. Um, I don't think it will add the subdirectories. I had to double check that. I think you need to add the dash R flag. Dash R is for recursive. So it keeps going down all the way uh, in the subdirectories. But to be honest, I had to check that, okay? I usually like to be explicit by doing git add and the name of the subdirectory. So if you do it in that way, then it will add all the files containing that particular subdirectory. And the reason for that is usually when you, and it's a good idea to actually have, I usually have a lot of subdirectories in my, in my repositories because it allowed me to categorize data. So for instance, if it's a big project, I may have a data subdirectory and I may have a documentation subdirectory and I may have a, a script subdirectory for post-processing of the data. If it is a paper, I may have the manuscript uh, subdirectory, figures subdirectory, a script subdirectory. And usually I like to do git add each of these subdirectories because then it allow me, give me the chance to do git commit separately. And then I can be specific about, okay, adding the data for the project, adding the figures for the manuscript, adding, you know, a script for post-processing data, something like that, okay. But yes, it is indeed possible. And, and, and again, I would personally recommend to have subdirectories and add those to, to the repository. All right. Um, so right now we have, we have these two files. Um, um, yeah, so that's, that's right. I, I, I usually don't like to use, uh, just commenting on, on Rasek, I don't like to use git add dot. It's a quick way to add everything, but you don't have fine control on what you are adding. So I, I, yeah, good point, Rasek. Uh, so let's say, so let's pretend that we're going to modify. We have these two files under version control. Let's pretend we're going to modify these files. So one way to modify, a very, very push man way to modify these files, let me say, 
is add some text to one of the files. So I'm going to say echo some more data, pretending that my text files contain data. And by using two greater than symbols, that means that uh, this line is going to be added to this file. So the temp.txt file uh, contained more uh, data or some data before, and now it will contain a second line saying some more data. So now there is a difference between the current version of the file temp.txt and the file that has been added to the repository. So the file stamp on, uh, on the TMT, uh, Temp, sorry, txt file contains now a different, a substantial difference between the, the, the current version of the file. How we can explore that? Well, git has another command or subcommand called diff. So you can do git diff and the name of the file. So in this case, it's the temp.txt file. And when you do that, basically the, git is going to run a, a Linux command called diff and compare these two versions of the file. And what it's telling you here is, well, there are differences. Uh, these are the, the, the way that keep, uh, that keep track of internal of these differences. But it's telling you in one file, in this first file or, or, or the repository file, there is just some data. And the, the current version, there is a plus, which means there is an additional line saying some more data. If I have delete something, it will say dash for minus, like remove it, and, and it will show what it was removed. But it's good because it can tell you that there are differences between the files. Now we can go on and say, ah, okay, good. I'm going to commit this new version of the file because I'm happy with my new data. So I'm going to do git add and the file name that we know is, is different from the, from the last version. And now explain why I commit in this new version. In this case is updating data due to new results, due to new data coming from the lab, from the observations, whatever. Okay, but that way now the versions of the files are, are synchronized between the repository and the current version I have on my, on my computer. I know at the beginning may, uh, maybe that picture I was showing you, that diagram I was showing you with, with the arrows may, may not do much sense, but I hope that now you are starting to see the pattern and what these arrows represented between the local directory and the repository and those, those lines, how they, they staggering and, uh, and the commits and, and how keeping track of those things um, happen. So that is how we add files that have been changed. Any questions about, uh, about this or anything else that we talked before? Okay, so the other thing I mentioned, which is very important to keep track of is the log, the log of changes. And if I run git log in my, in my simple example here, we, have, we will see that there were actually two, two commits. In this case, I had anonymized the commits, but it's, 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 it's me who was doing it. So it will show a, a long sequence of numbers and, and, and letters, which is kind of a tag. This is, it should be unique and that's why it's, it's too long. So you can pick point, uh, you can pick point these, uh, these changes by just giving this tag. And that's the way that we are going to then identify changes. It will, then it will say who did this and when it was done. And then this is the, the commit message. And this is why, again, I reinforce uh, this, why the commit messages should be uh, clean and, and, and usually brief, but they should be self-explanatory in the sense that they should contain enough information for you to understand what is going on. Um, Oh, sorry, I missed a question from Rob. I may not have caught this the first time around, but do you create a single repository for a project or one per project? I would say one, one repository per project, but your project then can have subdirectories, okay? So let's say that you're working in three or four papers. What I will do is create one repository per paper. Hopefully you will have folders for each paper. So you go into one of these, these folders and you initialize a repository there and then you add the corresponding files. Okay, sorry about that, I, I, I missed that. Thank you, Rancis, for, for catching that. Um, so the second commit, I noticed that they are ordered, uh, ordered chronologically. So the last one shows at the very top. So this is my second commit, updating the data due to whatever was the, the, the reason. And then that was my original commit and when they were done. Now, what this allow you is, okay, first of all, have, have track of what did do, what did, uh, what and when, 
but it also allow you to go back to a previous version. So let's say that, that I detected my data was corrupted and this was a long file. I just don't want to delete one single line in file. I want to delete different, file, different lines across the whole file. I could go back to my original commit. And there are different ways. There are at least three different ways you, you can roll back to a previous version. I'm just going to show you one that is the less invasive and usually works and usually it doesn't break anything. Usually, I will should emphasize usually, Git has some, some, sometimes some hiccups once in a while, but usually works straight and, and, and fine. So the command that you want to use is git checkout. And again, let me go back very quickly, very quickly at the beginning of this, this example or this diagram I showed you before. Um, so this dot represents this, this the, road, the dots on the very right arrow represents these IDs that were given to the, each of the commits. Think now about having an arrow. I should put this slide back there. Having an arrow as a pointer saying, okay, this is my current version for this particular file. When you do git checkout, what you're saying is, okay, take that arrow, which identifies your pointer and pass it to the previous version. That is kind of what is happening here. Um, which means, which means that the the future version, so we will roll back to the previous version, but it means that the future version is still part of your version control, which is something that is not necessarily bad. Now, at this point in time, if you decide to continue working with this file, what you can do is do something called branching. So it's like, like uh, splitting your timeline in a second branch and then continue evolving this file through that branch, which means that you, if for whatever reason you decide, you can even go back to this version and check what was in there. Again, I just wanted to mention this because it's something that happens once in a while in Git. Um, so it's, it's a nice feature to keep uh, in mind. Um, and I'm going to talk about branches in a second. Um, but, but again, it's, it's something that is, is doable, okay? So in this case, we just roll back to the previous version where there was just one line of the file. And I know the example is, is simple and silly enough, but I think at least you, you can catch up basically what is going on with these files and what are we doing with, with the version control, okay? Again, these tags are important. They come from the git log. So it's good that if you're going to do any of these changes, keep a copy of the git log just by redirecting this. So we're going to ask you from now on to submit these git logs just to see, we're going to see your gymnastics. We're going to see how frequently you commit we're going to see uh, how detailed you are in your messages. So these three things will matter, okay? Uh, I tell you, and I add this because many years um, people ask about this, how many ways you have for, for reverting or changing or going back to a previous version? Well, I, as I told you, there are at least three different ways. The one I shall show you and describe in the, in the diagram is called git checkout. It can work at the commit level or at the file level. What it means is if I have a commit that includes several files, I can go back to that stage or I can just pick point one single file. Um, and it does this, when you go back to that version, it branches, so it creates a parallel timeline of, of the evolution of your, your, your files. Alternately, what you can do is git reset. Git reset works in a very similar manner as git checkout. It works at the commit level or at the file level. You can do just for one single file. But the difference is that it basically discards any changes in the future. So it discards the other copy. So when you roll back to that, you won't, won't have access anymore to that version of, of the file. And alternately, I think I showed you this in one of the diagrams as well, there is the git revert. It only works at the commit level because it basically reverts. It's like an undo of your last commit, okay? So just one single undo um, and that is it. Now, all this, these commands are very powerful and they have some um, details that one should be aware of. So my, my recommendation is use with precaution any of those. And if you want to do that, just check with us or, or, or send us an email or, or, or ask because sometimes it can, it can generate some troubles, okay? But there are three different ways in which you can do, and depending what you want to do, maybe is, is a, one of them is the most suitable. I think the one I use the most is checkout because allow me in whatever case to go back to that previous version. Um, so it's, it's the safest in one way, okay? 
Anyhow, that's if you want to go back to a previous version. Now I have to tell you, if you did the git checkout and now you do git log, the only thing that you see is the former, the, the first, the very first commit to the repository. You lost track of the of the other one because basically you are now in a, in this parallel timeline. So that's why I'm saying before doing any of the, of this, just keep a copy of your git log because if you decide to do the git checkout, you have the ability to go back, but you need to have that ID to find that that new that old timeline if you wish. Um, what about if we want to delete a file? It sometimes happens. Sometimes if we do git add dots and you have all these object files, uh, you don't want the object files in your repository because those are temporary files that are regenerated every time you compile, for instance. Um, so how you remove them? Well, you use git rm for remove and then the name of the file. Now be aware that when you do that, git actually will purge, will remove the file from the local directory as well. It's like deleting. You don't do the, you don't need to do the git that here. Sorry, this is a left forward from the previous slide. And then you do the commit and then you say git commit temp2.txt uh, temp was removed from the repository and that's it. And now it says one file change. There are no insertions, but there is one deletion and this is the file that has been deleted. Okay, so that's how you purge, you, you delete files from the repository. Usually don't, you don't do that unless um, some garbage has get into the, the repository like auxiliary files or intermediate files, okay? If you want to rename a, a file, uh, I don't remember if I had this in the slides, but if you want to rename a file, what you do is git mb for move. So you rename in that way. So you, go, you do git, mb temp2.txt to whatever is the new name, and then you do a commit. And that's the proper way of renaming a file in the directory, in the repository, sorry. Okay. Uh, what else? So a quick summary, and again, this is most, uh, mostly for people that hasn't seen Git um, until now. Uh, you will start by downloading, and again, this step is only needed if you want to use in your computer, which I encourage you to do. Uh, download and install Git. This is the other one that I didn't put before, it's Git Bash. So it works in the three operating systems, probably is, is, is an overkill for Linux and Mac OS, but you can still run it if you wish. Um, once you, you, uh, you have Git installed, you can create your repository. So you can start with a new folder or a folder that you already have. Recall that you may need to identify yourself to Git. So run just Git config that's dash global username or user email, and then set up the repository and you're ready to go. Uh, you do as many times as you need, modify your files, update the changes, commit the changes, and recall to use git log. And git status is another one that is quite useful because it can tell you in a summarized manner which files have changed, which files are part of the repository and which files are not. Usually those are identified as untrack uh, files that are not being tracked by Git. Um, I mentioned branches very quickly, and then I will stop for a second for questions, and then maybe we have the chance to do a quick demo on the cluster. Uh, branches are, are a really, really nice way of having parallel developments going on. And this is very, very well suited for code development in particular. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, but it also can work with if you are working in documentation on the call, or if you are working in papers and you are not sure which direction you want to take on the paper, it's less less common. But I would say for code development is really really nice. So um, I took the, <laughs> the the pictures of Star Trek. Um, so you will start with one version. That's your your main track until some point in time where you decide to create branches. And branches are very easy to create. Uh, you by default you only have one branch. Uh, but if you want to, to, if you want to check, you can do git branch dash a will show all the branches that you have. Uh, you can also have remote branches and not necessarily local branches. This is mostly connected or it can be applied in the case that you have a repository in your local computer and you connect that repository with your repository in, on GitHub, for instance, or in the cluster. There could be different branches there. Now for creating a branch, it's very easy. You do git branch, my new branch. So you branch three times here in the example, or two times plus the main branch. Um, and then if you want to switch branches, you just do git checkout. What this allows you is there is a central body, a central core that remains the same, but then you can have 
minor changes. Let's say that you are developing a code for solving uh, hydrodynamics on, on, on general relativity, and then you want to try different methods. So what you can do is implement each of these methods, and then you can compare them and, and, and see how they differ, and not necessarily have three different files, but instead three different branches. Will the change that you make in these branches be saved in the original file in the directory? So that's the nice thing. As soon as you have many branches, there is just no one single file of this. There will be one file for each of these branches. And the nice thing is when you change, when you change branches, your local copy in the directory changes correspondingly. So let's say that we were trying something for branch 2A. When you do good check out branch 2A, now the files that you will see in your computer will be the corresponding ones for that. Now, if you go to branch 2B, then you can you will see the changes. You will see that that file changed as well. Okay, so basically everything is stored if you do the git ads, of course. Yes, it does multiple copies, but you don't see all of them at the same time. So every time that you do git checkout, there is only one file. Let's say the file was called Anson table, just for, for taking the, the example from the, from the assignment. And you are trying to modularize your Anson table, but you're doing differently in different branches just to test how, how it will do. And then when you are in branch 2A, you only will see once Anson table.cpp. But if you switch to branch 2B, you will still see Anson table.cpp. No duplication of file names or anything, but the files are different. And you can even compare those branches. You can do the git diff. Uh, you will do git diff branch 2A Anson table, branch 2B Anson table. So you can pick and point uh, which branches and which files you want to compare. It's super, super powerful. It can get complicated with some things, but it's really, really powerful. I, I strongly recommend. It's very good when you are developing code and you are not certain about uh, is the change. I, I'm working on the code, something I want to keep, something that will actually contribute to the code, and just testing. So usually what I what I do is I have that test and development branch for trying new things. So if I screw something, I know then I can basically cut the branch and throw it away or, or keep it if I like the changes. Yes, Michael, uh, now a specific question. Will initializing a repo in your home directory cause you to accumulate many files towards the limit if you... Uh, not necessarily... Usually Git is very um, smart with the amount of information that accumulates. is 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 uh, is aggregative in the sense that it takes the first snapshot and then adds. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend starting a Git repository in your home directory. I could try to organize things. Um, it's possible, especially if you have amount of, like large amount of data, if you have bulky data files and you're putting them under version control, it's possible that um, that made you run out of the quota. There is an easy way to check. You can do um, the command, let me type in the, um, in the chat. You can do the command du, Sorry, soon likes to capitalize. Uh, DUS, and then um, let's put dir, a particular directory, and maybe DUS dash H dir. The H is for having the units in a human readable way. Um, so this will allow you to have an idea how much is, is storing. So if you want to see how much. Um, information or data is being stored in your .git directory. You do dus -h -s .git, and that will allow you to have an idea. But I'm more concerned with you having a repository in your home directory. We'll try to be more specific about that, about which project you will put. Yeah, that's another one for counting the number of files. Correct. Okay, good question though. Yeah, those are part of the, of the things that the housekeeping things that one need to consider when using Git. Um, what else? Um, yes, that's right. So for each assignment, you would like to have a repo in, in that particular folder. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this part because mostly because due to time, uh, we're a little bit over the hour now. But this is a nice slide to come back if you want to do some uh, remote and local repositories and how to connect and how to set up your own Git repository. Um, so I would, I would recommend 
coming back to this if you're interested in that and ask me. Um, I see a couple of questions, so let me see, Brandon. So say for us, uh, that one and we go. Rob, so Nayara will, uh, will use... Um, so Rob, are you talking about the project, the, the project space in particular? Uh, we were not going to use project. Um, usually project, the name may be a little bit confusing, but project is reserved for when you want to share information across different groups. Um, think about people doing genomics where they need to have a long or large data files containing reference sequences, those kind of things, or, or a main file that you may find, uh, share with other people. It could be any discipline actually, but it's more for, for that. Um, um, but yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Let, let us know if there is any, any specific thing that you want to know about project. Yeah. Uh, so this is a quick summary of some of the most useful commands I usually do on Git, uh, the ones on blue actually, uh, as we saw branch, we talk about check out a uh, clone. Hopefully we may be able to, to show you an example, but basically it allows you to take a repository and create a replica of it in your local space. So we'll, hopefully I will be able to show you that in a second. Um, commit, differences, init, log, move was the one I was mentioning for, for renaming files. Pull and push you will use when, um, when you have to connect repositories in, in different machines. Um, and then a status, and I think that's mostly it. But yeah, as you can imagine, Git, Git is a complex tool worth exploring and worth learning, I would recommend. Um, just a bit of summary, um, try to use as much as possible, commit very frequently, include sensible comments in your, in your commits. Do not commit derivative stuff. Examples of these are executable, object files, anything that is regenerated every time that you compile code, for instance. Um, there are different versions of version control. I, we talk and, and saw the details about Git today, but there is Mercurial, older ones as SVN or CVS. So usually people like to use this one. Git, I think, is one of the most common ones, but Mercurial has, uh, has some popularity as well because mostly works directly from Python, so um, that could be nice. There is way more information about this, as you can probably realize, we just um, scratched the top of the iceberg here, um, and these are some good resources. Even the web-based options has good documentation about Git, so I invite you to, to look at them if, if, if you wish. And now, if you allow me, let me see if we can do a very quick um, example. Hope that you guys can see my, my terminal there. So I'm going to connect to the teach cluster. Okay, as you probably remember, I, I don't need to type my password because I have keys associated with that. Um, but let me see if I can show you how to, um, so let's do, let's create a directory uh, for the course. And this is just one for demonstrating Git examples. So I'm going to create that, uh, it's empty. There's nothing there right now. Um, so you can follow along the examples on the slide, but now I want to show you uh, how to do a clone. And this is something that you may probably uh, need to do this is going to be in your PC system 10. Um, and now what I'm going to do, as you can see, there is a dot git uh, versions of the Anson table. So I'm going to just do git clone Anson table here. Um, because it's a, it's a repository, now you, you can see git is cloning that repository. It says git cloning uh, into Anson table. And now if I do ll there is Anson table. If I do ls dash a, just that directory, but now I can do cd and some table and then do ls a. And you can see this uh, hidden directory dot git. Actually, I can do git log here and I can see that runs is created uh, or put the, the Anson table directory for, for assign from assignment two into version control. So now I can do, for instance, this is a command I didn't show you, but it's a nice one. 
you can do git ls files and see which actually files are from um, are part of the repository and it will list uh, which files are in the repository you can do git status as well uh, it says nothing to commit because there's nothing that has changed but obviously if i were go some anson table.cpp and i just even add just one uh, line here which has comments um i just modified that file and now do git the status again well now we say uh anson table is modified uh and then your options are add and commit of course or you can do git diff for instance and if i do git diff it will just look for that file and say okay that's the difference uh you add these two lines i can do i can be specific about the file and it will show the same information uh, but basically it allows you to follow what what is there so this is something that you you probably will have to do you will certainly have to do for assignment um three which by the way it will it will be posted later today it will involve the same code as, as for assignment um two um now the the things we are going to ask you are basically related to to arrays and, and arrays and version control so even when you may not have feedback from assignment two, the, the, the things we will ask you are going to be orthogonal to the ones that you develop for assignment two. So you, you shouldn't worry much about if you have problems with, with the submission for assignment two, you, you can start fresh from, from this one. Uh, that's a that's a good point, Darshes. Yes, it could be a way. <laughs> it could be a, a, an overkilling way, but it will work. So the way it will work is you will create a clone of or of your local repository in the teach cluster, and then every time you you do that, you will need to do git push and git pull. Uh, so if I do that in my local computer and I'm modifying something, I do git commit, and then I will do git push. And then you will do git pull from the from the teach cluster. Now, if you really want to do that, you will need to go back to that slide I skipped before about having like a server. Um, it will require some of those things. It's doable, but it will require that you set up the repository with some some additional stuff. But it's doable. Alternatively, what you could do is you can use GitHub as an intermediate and then clone things directly from GitHub either in your local computer and in the teach cluster. Yes, that's true. So there are some details that, that are, are hidden there, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely doable and it's a nice way to work. We usually do that a lot, a lot uh, even for when we develop the material for the course, we have a central repository and both Francis and myself, we clone that and, and work in our own copies and then we push and everything is, 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 is it has duplication even if you wish, because it's in the local clones that we have plus the central living copy that, that is on the repository. So again, I think it's a, it's a really nice tool. It's a tool that I would encourage you guys to use not only for the course, uh, hopefully for all your projects involving code and involving manuscripts, data, is, is definitely something worth spending some time getting familiar with and comfortable with. Um, really, really good tool to, to keep in mind. Okay. So I think that's it for today. Um, any questions about Git? Any questions about assignment two? And as I mentioned before, assignment three is going to be posted later today. It will involve Git. It will involve a little bit of other rates. It will involve the Anson on table code. But don't worry about uh, the implementation you submitted for assignment two. It will be uh, a little bit different and not overlapping, not requiring to, to have the working code for assignment two. Right. Um, okay, so it looks like there, there are no questions. As usual, if you guys still have questions later on, feel free to post things on the forum. The forum has been quite active. So even if you don't have questions, but want to see what is going on there, it's, it's a, good, um, a good place to, to, to find some questions and answers. Um, and if not, if you think that is something more specific that you would like us to take a particular uh, look at your code or something 
um, explicit about a particular implementation you are doing, just shoot us an email at courses at signet.utron.ca and, and we can take a look at that. All right. Um, no problem, Rob. Uh, so, yeah, that's it for today. Uh, stay tuned for the assignment, and tomorrow um, we have office hours. Uh, so, if you still have any questions, probably about assignment three, uh, feel free to to come by. And good afternoon, everyone.